virtual event. I'm Rachel, the Adult Outreach and Event Coordinator, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. We have a wonderful presentation ahead to discuss Juneteenth. If you have questions at any point, please put them in the chat. We will have time at the end to go over some questions. Please help me welcome today's special guest, Robin Andrews of the Furman University Libraries. So Robin joined the Furman Libraries in 2007 as a circulation supervisor and is now a Pathways Advisor for students, the inaugural diversity coordinator for the libraries, and co-chair of the President's Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She's also an award winner. She has earned both the Staff Member of the Year Award and the Meritorious Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award. We are so pleased that she is here today um, to educate us and talk about Juneteenth. Thank you for joining us, Robin. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for inviting me and the Greenville County Library. And I thank you all for coming. So in all transparency, when Rachel asked me if I would be interested in doing a presentation on Juneteenth, I paused for a long time because first I was honored that she would ask, but second, I was sure I didn't know anything about Juneteenth, at least not enough to talk about it. But once I agreed, I had to start doing the research and I wondered why I didn't already have a more general knowledge of this now national holiday. Why didn't we learn this in school along with Independence Day and President's Day and all the other holidays, formal or informal? So I thought today I would talk a little bit about what I found, the origins of the holiday, you know, beyond the date and the end of slavery, try to figure out why we didn't learn about this in history class, why it's important to celebrate, not just for African Americans, and how we can all celebrate Juneteenth today. A note before we begin, I am not an expert nor a historian. I leave that to my colleagues at Furman. And also I'll be using the terms African-American, Black Americans, Black people, slaves and enslaved peoples interchangeably. So what is Juneteenth? Well, it's a holiday commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. Today, it is a national federal holiday, Juneteenth National Independence Day. Still, many Americans are unaware of the history and significance of June 19th. Originally called Jubilee Day, a biblical reference to the freeing of slaves, the name Juneteenth, which is a combination of June and 19th, actually first appeared around 1890. Juneteenth is also known as Freedom Day or Emancipation Day, but Juneteenth is pretty catchy, so it's the name that stuck. Juneteenth, however, was a bit challenging to celebrate because Black people were often banned from gathering in public spaces. Early celebrations were often held in churches and involved prayer, sermons, singing, and family gatherings. The preacher would read the text of the Emancipation Proclamation, and attendees would take turns telling their own recollections of that first Juneteenth. Dressing up was also important, not just because it was a holiday, but also because most Blacks, while slaves, had worn little more than rags. In 1872, Black leaders in Texas began pooling money to buy land so they could have a place to celebrate. The most famous of those parks is Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas, the oldest public park in Texas created for that reason. Founded by former slaves, these men and others collected $800, which is almost $15,000 in today's dollars, to purchase 10 acres of land as a place to commemorate the anniversary of their emancipation. That purchase represented not only their freedom, but property ownership and African-American commerce. Many of these parks are still around today, but before we get ahead of ourselves, let's rewind a little bit. So didn't the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 end slavery? Well, sort of. So here's something we probably did learn in school. Lincoln freed the slaves. And yes, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 says in part that all persons held as slaves are and henceforward shall be free. And this was to take effect on January 1st, 1863. However, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't have the power in and of itself to create or free anyone because it only applied to the rebellious states, also known as the Confederate States of America or the Confederacy, the ones that seceded from the Union, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. That means it applied to approximately 500,000 enslaved people. 
Unfortunately, there were around 4 million enslaved people at that time. Also, it could only apply and be enforced if Union troops captured that state, leaving slavery untouched in the loyal border states. It also expressly exempted parts of the Confederacy that had already come under Northern control. So the freedom it promised depended upon what state you were enslaved and military victories. If the Union troops hadn't arrived in your state, neither had freedom if you were an enslaved person. So this is a map of the United States around 1863. And blue indicates the Union states. And to be clear, slavery still existed in some of these states. It just wasn't state-sanctioned slavery. The light blue represents those border states that were slave states. They just didn't secede from the Union. Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and that shiny new state of West Virginia. The red represents the Southern states. The gray areas were US territories with the exception of the indigenous territory, which later became Oklahoma. So although the Emancipation Proclamation initially did not end slavery for everyone, after January 1st, 1863, every advance of federal troops expanded the domain of freedom for enslaved people. Another important point is that the proclamation allowed black men to be accepted into the Union Army and Navy. So by the end of the war, almost 200,000 black soldiers and sailors had fought for the Union and their own freedom. So June 19th, 1865, General Gordon Granger arrives in Galveston announcing the end of slavery. So what took so long? Okay, so I'll confess, I literally thought it took two years to get the message to Texas because information just couldn't cloppity clop on horseback that fast across the entire country in 1863. I also forgot about trains, but the reality is much different and a little more complicated. Many people believe that the Civil War ended when General Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia on April 9th, 1865. Not quite, because little did I know there were multiple Confederate armies so that the true end came when the Union Army captured the state of Texas on June 2nd, 1865. Texas was the last to surrender, and that's why once that happened, General Gordon Granger was able to make his announcement because federal troops were now in control of the state of Texas. General Granger hand wrote a note called General Orders Number no. Three to put into effect and enforce the Emancipation Proclamation officially announcing that slaves were free. So I know this is a little difficult to read, but it's general orders number three, the announcement that all slaves are free, that there is absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection between them becomes employer and hired labor. But it's the next sentence, however, that is most interesting. The freedmen are advised to remain at their present homes and work for wages. That was a big assumption that former slave masters who were used to free labor would somehow, in the blink of an eye, decide to pay the very laborers that a minute prior were free labor. Not surprisingly, many slaves decided not to take them up on that offer, and they left immediately or as soon as they could, mainly to find their loved ones who had either been freed, escaped, or sold away. And this is sometimes referred to as the scatter. Searching for family members who had been separated or sold away became the focus of many formerly enslaved individuals. And the number of years of separation did not deter people from hoping to reunite with lost loved ones. Newspaper advertisements, letters, and word of mouth were all employed as part of the search Again, I apologize for the readability. On the left is an ad placed by a man searching for his uncle. He speaks of how his uncle had been brought from his first owner and taken to Texas, but because he became ill, he was sent back to Alabama, leaving his wife behind. And in the ad, he asks that preachers and readers sympathize in his search because preachers would read these notices during church. On the right, Edward Taylor is looking for his entire family, his father, mother, four brothers and a sister. His ad reads that they all separated long before the war. 
And as I read some of these ads, it became a sad endeavor because even in the midst of the joy of freedom, a sadness still remained. So did slavery end in Texas on Juneteenth? Well, not exactly. So remember those border states from the map, those light blue states? Well, Maryland and Missouri, two of those border states on the Union side, abolished slavery late in the war. But Delaware and Kentucky, also border states, rejected all efforts by the Union to end slavery, even rejecting the ratification of the 13th Amendment. As a result, slavery remained perfectly legal in both states for another six months after Juneteenth until the U.S. Secretary of State certified the 13th Amendment had been ratified by enough states, 27, to become law. Did I mention the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, the one that outlawed theoretically slavery once and for all? If you're wondering about where the 13th Amendment fits in all this, it was still circulating around the states for ratification on that first Juneteenth, and it wasn't finally ratified until December of 1865 and officially abolished slavery on the United States Constitution. Also, it wasn't as easy as just picking up your stuff and leaving. Remember, slaves didn't have stuff. Whatever stuff they had belonged to the master of the plantation. Abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote that his people were free, but without roofs to cover them or bread to eat or land to cultivate. And enslavers weren't too eager to part with what they felt was their property, even though they were human beings. When freed people tried to leave, many of them were beaten, lynched, or murdered. So when we're talking about the end of slavery, there are really three dates to consider in the freeing of enslaved peoples in the United States. The Emancipation Proclamation, Juneteenth, and ratification of the 13th Amendment. And you'll notice that there's almost three years between Lincoln's initial promise and the actual fulfillment of that promise, sort of. It took three-fourths of the 36 existing states to ratify the 13th Amendment back in 1865. Illinois was the first on February 1st, and the 27th state to ratify was Georgia on December 6th, although Oregon was a close second, so they were right behind, and I'll give them a little credit too. Other states followed, but there were four states that rejected it. Of those four states, Kentucky, Delaware, and New Jersey eventually ratified the amendment. New Jersey the following year in Delaware in 1901. Kentucky took a bit longer, ratifying in 1976. And then there was Mississippi. Mississippi did eventually vote to ratify the amendment, and it only took 148 years to do so in 1995. But even that didn't go smoothly. Mississippi ratified the amendment, but failed to make it official by notifying the U.S. archivist. So the ratification wasn't actually certified until 2013. That's a long legacy from rejection in the 19th century to certification in the 21st century. So now slaves are free? Well, free-ish. Slavery by any other name. The 13th Amendment states, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. But in the middle of that amendment, it says, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. So it doesn't take much to see a gaping loophole enabling the continuation of slavery just by another name. Lawmakers use this phrase to make petty offenses crimes. When blacks were found guilty of committing these petty offenses, now crimes, they were imprisoned and then leased out to the same businesses and plantations that lost slaves after the passing of the 13th Amendment. To give a little context, at the start of the Civil War, the South was producing 75% of the world's cotton, the world's cotton, creating more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi River Valley than anywhere in the country. The system of convict labor is called peonage or debt slavery, compelled to work to pay off a debt. This made a business of arresting blacks and it was very lucrative. which is why hundreds of white men were hired by some states as police officers whose primary responsibility was to search out and arrest Blacks who were in violation of Black codes. Black codes were restrictive laws designed to limit the freedom of African-Americans 
and ensure their availability as a cheap labor force after slavery was abolished. Once arrested, these men, women, and children would be leased to plantations where they would harvest cotton, tobacco, and sugarcane, or they would be leased to work at coal mines or railroad companies, and the owners of these businesses would pay the state for every prisoner. And it's believed that after passing the 13th Amendment, as many as 800,000 Blacks were part of the system of peonage or re-enslavement. To that end, Mississippi and South Carolina enacted the first Black codes, codes like needing to get permission if you were Black to preach in front of a Black congregation. They could actually even apprentice out a child and keep them until they were 18 if you were a woman or 21 if you were a male. They could discipline them and they could also retrieve them if they escaped and ran away. This postcard titled Stripes But No Stars from Asheville, North Carolina was considered humorous. Notice that all the convicts are African-American, but in the distance, you can see two white men, one of which is holding a shotgun. It doesn't look like those convicts are having much fun. Well, what this postcard really shows is forced labor. Many of those forced to work on railroad projects were either falsely accused or faced trumped up charges for minor offenses. And once convicted, nobody questioned whether it was true, you would just forever be a convict. Some of these men died in landslides and cave-ins, others due to malnutrition, and still others were shot attempting to escape. The exact number of these individuals who lost their lives during the construction of the Western North Carolina Railroad is unknown. But what historians do know is that the rail link connecting Western North Carolina with the Eastern part of the state would not have been completed without those prisoners. Yet today, the hundreds of former slaves who endured unspeakable hardships while helping lay tracks and excavate tunnels are mostly forgotten. So why didn't we learn about Juneteenth in school? Well, to be fair, if you grew up in Texas, you probably did. Another reason is that it may not have been as big of a deal in places where many slaves have been free for a year or more. Some other reasons, the usual, historical omission. Historically, the curriculum in many schools has tended to focus more on the perspectives and experiences of white Americans. You know that old saying about history is written by the winners. Well, many curriculums focused on the winning, neglecting the contributions and experiences of people from diverse backgrounds. As a result, important events like Juneteenth were often overlooked or omitted. There's a regional emphasis. There are no national social studies standards to mandate what topics or historical figures students must learn about. Juneteenth has stronger historical and cultural significance in certain regions of the United States. So its recognition and celebration may have been more prevalent. It's not an official holiday for everyone. It's a federal holiday and it's gained national recognition, but prior to that, its recognition and observance varied from state to state. The lack of widespread acknowledgement at the national level may have contributed to its omission from school curricula as well, especially if you were in one of those original Confederate states, such as, well, South Carolina. But in 2020, CBS News conducted a two month long investigation in how black history is taught in schools across the country. In Massachusetts, the social standards mention slavery and enslaved people more than 60 times. In third grade, students are expected to learn that colonial Massachusetts had both free and enslaved Africans in its population. In fifth grade, students discuss slavery and the legacy of the Civil War. But in neighboring New Hampshire, the state standards mention the word slavery and racism as part of a theme on social and race relations. And it's not just about referencing slavery, but how it's referenced. Sadly, in West Virginia state standards, slavery is reduced to an example explaining the concept of supply and demand in specific historic situations. In North Carolina state standards, slavery is called immigration of Africans to the American South. They just left out the part about being brought to this country by brute force against their will. I was happy to find though, that in a current South Carolina textbook for grade eight, Juneteenth is listed in the index. So what else did my history teacher forget to tell me? Well, remember when I told you I thought that news of the Emancipation Proclamation took so long because of the slowness of travel of horseback? 
In fact, though, Lincoln's administration used innovative technology, the telegraph, to send and receive information about the war. News of the final proclamation was disseminated from the War Department's telegraph office on January 1st, 1863. So theory holds that the proclamation was common knowledge by the time Granger arrived in Galveston. Also, enslaved peoples had their own network for coded communication between plantations, so that it's very likely that word had spread to Texas long before Granger arrived, especially since slaveholders would move to slave-friendly Texas to avoid the oncoming Union Army, and those slaves would have already known about the Emancipation Proclamation. And yes, we learned that Lincoln freed the slaves, but Lincoln wasn't as concerned with freeing slaves as he was with winning, which meant keeping the Union, well, united. In a letter to newspaper editor Horace Greeley, Lincoln said, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Lincoln chose the latter, prioritizing the Civil War and preserving the Union, then with freeing all slaves. But he ended that letter with this. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. And remember those 40 acres and a mule? We probably learned about that in school too. But what my history teacher didn't tell me was that those million acres were rich coastal Southern farmland that would be taken from slaveholders and given to the formerly enslaved. Special Field Orders Number 15. The Freedmen's Bureau had already redistributed a portion of that acreage to nearly 40,000 Black families. What my teacher didn't tell me was why I never got them. And Andrew Johnson, who became president following the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in April 1865, issued a proclamation of pardon and amnesty to citizens in the South who took an oath of allegiance. And around the same time, rescinded special field orders number 15, returning all that land to former slaveholders. Did you know that there is a Juneteenth flag? The flag was created by activist Ben Haith, founder of the National Juneteenth Celebration Foundation. Haith and others created the flag in 1997 with the help of Boston-based illustrator Lisa Jean Graff. The white star in the center of the flag has a dual meaning, representing both Texas and the freedom of African Americans in all 50 states. The white bursting outline around the star is inspired by a nova, a new star, representing a new beginning for African Americans. The arc or the curve that extends across the width of the flag represents a new horizon, the opportunities and promise that lay ahead. And the colors red, white, and blue represent the American flag, a reminder that slaves and their descendants were and are Americans. So why is Juneteenth important? Well, for the same reason that July 4th is important, the historical significance. It's an important milestone in American history. The abolitionist Frederick Douglass once asked, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is constant victim. It's as important to honor the anniversary of the freedom granted to enslaved African-Americans as it is to celebrate the anniversary of the freedom granted to the United States winning independence from the British. It serves as a reminder of the struggles and sacrifices made by African-Americans and others in the fight for abolition of slavery and future equality. Celebrating Juneteenth is a way to honor all those who sacrifice for that freedom, no matter their race or ethnicity. And it's an opportunity to reflect on those who came before us, our ancestors, and to measure the weight of their contributions and think about what work there is left to do. Are we honoring the depth and breadth of their sacrifices? Juneteenth has its roots in the African-American community, but it is a holiday that is open to all Americans to celebrate. And it increases awareness so future generations won't have to ask, why didn't we learn this in school? Celebrating Juneteenth helps raise awareness about the history of slavery the experiences of African-Americans, and the ongoing struggle for civil rights. 
It provides an opportunity to educate people, especially younger generations, about the significant chapter in American history that is sometimes overlooked or underrepresented. It's not just about the past. It's not just about freedom. It's also about resilience. It's about recognizing how our ancestors survived, survived the fear of being stolen from their homeland, survived brutal enslavement, survived peonage, survived Jim Crow, survived segregation, survived integration, and still continue to survive today. So now that Juneteenth is a federal holiday, we all get the day off, right? Yeah, no, not exactly. As with a few holidays, federal employees get time off. But for others, it's very dependent on where they live and where they work. So the yellow states are those that give state government workers a day off for Juneteenth. The asterisks mean in California and North Carolina, it's a floating holiday. In Pennsylvania, some employees under the governor's jurisdiction get the day off as an official annual observance. In Illinois, state workers get a paid holiday for Juneteenth, but only if it falls on a weekday. And in Alabama, it's a state holiday authorized by the governor, but hasn't made it law by the legislature. So what's on a Jubilee celebration menu? Well, there are some traditions associated with celebrating Juneteenth. One of the most popular is in the form of a cookout. Some of you may call it a barbecue. And that celebration is going to include red foods. Juneteenth celebrations are associated with a rich and distinct culinary tradition that features red foods and drinks. The historical importance of red food traces back to the time of enslavement. Bread symbolizes the bloodshed associated with the brutal history of slavery, but it's also a symbol of strength, resilience, and joy. Africans brought their homeland traditions with them, which manifested itself through food, red beverages like strawberry sodas or hibiscus ginger tea, and red dishes like strawberry pie, red velvet cake, and red beans and rice. And yes, watermelon, which happens to be in peak season during the month of June. The main course was and still is barbecue. Smoked sauce covered barbecued meats are considered a red food and maybe the most important feature on the Juneteenth table. Already a staple food of the South, the preparation methods that go into cooking and serving create community. There are multiple 19th century newspaper reports that called for entire communities to gather at the local barbecue pit or grounds to prepare food and eat together in honor of Juneteenth. In small towns all over, whole cows, pigs, or goats were roasted over a fire pit dug in the ground, which is a method of preparation straight from Africa. The side meals, they are prosperity meals. They typically make up the side dishes that are served on Juneteenth, and they are musts. You might recognize a few foods from New Year's celebrations because it's still about celebrating good luck and wishing for the best for the future. Black-eyed peas and pork represent wealth. Collard greens or any dish using leafy vegetables are said to bring good fortune. And corn symbolizes gold. And though not a prosperity meal, potato salad is generally seen as non-negotiable at any decent cookout. Collard greens and sweet potatoes are historical additions because they were easy crops to harvest. So how can we celebrate Juneteenth? Well, for one, you do what we're doing today. You show up, you learn more about Juneteenth, and then you tell others about what you learned. And definitely don't just depend on me. For folks like Rachel, who have the ability to create, need to create this programming. Come together in community and celebrate the joy of being together through food and local cultural events. And most importantly, reflect on the history that brought us together to celebrate this holiday. Look at this day as a day of remembrance, but also a day to be active. This should be an active, involved, participatory holiday. Of course, like Memorial Day and July 4th, we have cookouts and barbecues, but you can also, also donate your time and money to the community and causes that help African-Americans overcome some of those initial hurdles. We also must find our way back to being ourselves and expressing not just the pressure of a life that was put on us, but the real pure life that our ancestors laid out for us. 
Bootsy Collins is an African-American musician and a wise one at that. Because remember, this isn't just advice for African-Americans. We all need to find our way back to being ourselves. Another tradition to honor Juneteenth can be to rest. And when I think about my ancestors, I think of slavery, I think of work, I think of toil, I think of weariness, tiredness, the weariness of fear and uncertainty. Trisha Hersey, founder of Nat Ministry, tells us rest is a beautiful interruption in a world with no pause button. Juneteenth gives us a reason to pause and reflect on why we're celebrating what we're celebrating, why there was a Juneteenth and the unfortunateness of its existence. Take a trip. There are so many ways to learn about history outside of books, says the person who works in a library and reads books. But there are numerous museums that focus on African-American history. There's the Slave Mart Museum in Charleston, which once housed a slave auction gallery and is believed to be the last slave auction facility in South Carolina. Our newest addition is the International African American Museum, also located in Charleston. It's on the site where Gadsden Wharf once stood. It was the arrival point of up to 40% of all American enslaved persons. Most famously, of course, is the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. It is more than just a museum, it is an experience. Upon its opening, President Barack Obama said, a clear-eyed view of history can make us uncomfortable and shake us out of familiar narratives, but it is precisely because of that discomfort that we learn and grow and harness our collective power to make this nation more perfect. That's the American story that this is museum. And be on the lookout for the National Juneteenth Museum being built in Fort Worth, Texas, which is scheduled to open on, when else, Juneteenth in 2025. Read a book and watch a show. Didn't really think I was going to say go to, not go to the local branch of your public library and find books and more on Black history. Uh, some of my recommendations are On Juneteenth by Annette Gordon-Reed, Light for the World to See by Kwame Alexander, the Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson and the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones and the controversy that surrounds it. For video, try these offerings currently on the PBS website. There's Juneteenth, Faith and Freedom. There's Juneteenth, Freedom and the Fine Print. This is an episode from PBS's digital studio series, Say It Loud, and it's some of the best 15 minutes that you'll spend. And then there's Juneteenth Jamboree. The Black author and activist W.E.B. Du Bois said that the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then moved back again towards slavery. Recently, President Biden said, America is no fairy tale. It's been a constant push and pull between two parts of our character. The idea that all men and women, all people are created equal and that racism has torn us apart. For me, Juneteenth is a celebration of resilience. And my hope is that we use the opportunity given through the holiday of Juneteenth to move us, all of us, further away from slavery and closer toward each other. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rachel, for inviting me. And I hope you all take care. Thank you so much, Robin. I know I learned a lot from your presentation. I'm sure that our uh, viewers have as well. We just want to allow a, a few moments in case anyone had any questions. Um, I imagine a lot of people are going to be doing some research on those resources you mentioned. Uh, if you are watching the recording, I will have the links to those resources in the video description that you can check out from your local library. So stay tuned for that. Um, getting lots of applause in the in the chat. People are saying thank you <laughs> for your presentation. That was wonderful. Just wait a couple more moments to see if anybody had any questions. I did not know um, about the Juneteenth Museum coming to Fort Worth. So that's exciting. That'll be, I'm sure, a wealth of information for us all to look at and to check out their website uh, as that's coming along. Yes, it has. I did not know. I was doing a general search and it came up and they have a great website 
um, it's it's pretty extensive. There are um, diagrams and pictures of what the museum is going to look like, the reasoning behind um, the way it's designed. So it, I was I was um, really impressed. And so now uh, something to put on the old travel itinerary. That's right. That's right. What a, a fantastic trip that would be too. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, I'm sure everyone is digesting all this information and possibly planning their celebrations for this upcoming Juneteenth. <laughs> um, but we want to thank you so much uh, for coming and sharing your uh, wealth of information, your time and your energy and resources uh, to make this presentation happen uh, so that all of our viewers can, can learn something, educate themselves and know what to do uh, as we move forward celebrating Juneteenth. So thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our viewers today. And for those of you watching the recording, if you haven't already, be sure to get your library card so that you can check out uh, more information about Juneteenth and learn more about African-American history. We've got lots of databases that you can explore as well. All of those will be available in our video description too. Uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss other wonderful events like this one. We want to see you in your local library soon. Thank you for joining us and I hope you celebrate Juneteenth in a way that will honor its history. Have a great evening.